before you even jump in, one of the first things people say is like, where do I buy? And they haven't even spoken to a mortgage broker. Um, that's the best place to start. When you're starting out, join this forum and say, where do I start? And then go onto the, the little search icon and then type in broker and, and start talking to some brokers. Um, one really important thing I think that is overlooked for a team member, you need to build out an A team, a team of, uh, of financial people that understand the property market way more than you. This is not a solo sport. Um, financial freedom is like climbing a mountain, right? No, no one has climbed Mount Everest by themselves. They have a team of people that help them along the journey. So as you're climbing, you're getting help. Now, you can absolutely try and climb Mount Everest by yourself. But what is going to happen is you're going to get halfway up this road and this path and then, one, you're going to get stuck there because you don't know what you're doing. Or two, you're going to have to reverse and go all the way back down. Um, so I think building out a, t a core team of, of accountants, um, mortgage brokers, um, uh, conveyances, good, good, good conveyancer can really mess up a deal. Um, buyer's agents, if you're going down that route. Um, but yeah, education is, is, is fundamental. Let's imagine you've got your 20 years time or 10 years time. You want 100 and I don't know, 150, 100 K is the magic number people throw out there. Let's with a bit of inflation, let's say 150. So people, you want 150 K in 10 or 15 years or 20 years. So you should be saying to your broker saying, okay, great. Here's what I want to do. Building out, helping build out that plan with them and sort of saying, and, and they can sort of assist you to say, based on your numbers, they can punch your numbers into a system and it's going to change over time. You're not, you're not going to, it's not a static plan. So in, in, I mean, credit policies change week to week or month to month and, and all that sort of thing. So, but at least if you have that sort of, if it's four properties that gets you there, or if it's five properties, then you know exactly what you need to do. And, 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 and that's where asking your broker, well, what, what experience have you had with helping a, helping a property investor build their portfolio? What things do I need to do? Do I need to increase my income or, or do I need to, um, yeah, what do I need to do to, to get to that situation is, is a vital question to ask. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of people just say, I want to buy property, which is not always the best case. What you need to do is, like, what I like to think about is paint that picture for where, what's your end state? Like a lot of people, it's just replace my income. All I want to do is replace the income that I'm on. Okay, great. Well, how are you going to do that? Is it going to be um, like, let's say, say $150,000 is how much you want to want to go so okay $150,000 divided by five properties that's 30 grand um, free cash flow that you need every single uh, for each property continually um, yep. so great you need to go out there and find five properties and then get that the challenge is and and this is why you need um, someone to help you but you also need a, a platform or a tool that's going to allow you to do that this is not something i always see these people that are like hey you're going to use this tech tool that's going to do absolutely everything for you it, it's just too too many variables and you need someone else to guide it so um you can do it yourself obviously but yeah i like i prefer having like a strategy laid out where it's got someone that knows what they're talking about when it comes to strategy you enter in your uh your end goal you enter where you currently are now and then the, you know builds builds the best path to get you there but at, at each point when you get a new property that pl that pr plan is i like to think about it like when you look at something really close everything else is super blurry so this thing is crystal clear this next property the whole point of doing a property kind of plan is that this next property is going to be 100 percent crystal clear of what i need it to be to allow me to get into these next ones. And then that third one is way too blurry for you to see. But then when you've got this next one, you then ask the question to your broker, Mr. Broker or Mrs. Broker, what does this next property need to be to allow me to get into this next one? Because that is one of the most crucial things. And they're going to say to you, well, look, you you need to actually get a super cash flow positive property right now because you can't afford to buy another one after this because it's going to it's going to it's going to lock you in or hey your income's actually pretty good you could buy five properties after this you have a borrowing capacity of 1.8 million dollars so you could actually go really really heavy um, but then you might get stuck in a little bit so then you need to get to that point and then um, yeah and then go back to the broker and say what do i need to do now how do i get to that next one yeah, the, the the trap that I see um, some people sort of get 
get get into with brokers or accountants or whoever it is 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 they they kind of expect the broker to tell them the exact kind of okay here's here's the exact plan and and don't get me wrong i'm sure there's like one or two brokers and one or two accounts out there in the world that have the time or just super but you have to take some accountability for that as well you can't yeah like a broker will tell you how they can get you the finance um but at the same time and they'll sort of give you a bit of guidance a bit of help but you all you absolutely need to sort of like you ask the questions and then you go and implement what they're asking you to do if, if you expect a broker to say okay here's the He's the exact kind of when you're purchasing properties and all that sort of stuff. I think it's it's probably a bit short sight, a little bit of expectations too high. A broker is really good at getting finance. But some of the, probably one of the more pointed questions I would ask a broker to see if they are an investment savvy broker is, how have you helped somebody who struggled with 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 um, getting stuck with their borrowing capacity? Like how have you helped somebody who hit a serviceability wall? Because that, mm. that will, inf- and of course, they can always, there's six salespeople out there who will tell you, oh, I do X, one Z, and they'll get found out pretty quickly when, when you go back to them in a year's time and, and they can't actually do what they've said they can do. So, but, yeah. but that's kind of, yeah, like that's kind of one of the qualifying questions I'll ask somebody. And, and some of the answers to that is if they're talking talk about things like multi-lender strategy and things like resetting loan terms and and None of this is financial advice, but do speak to your broker who has an Australian credit license, all that sort of stuff. But if you, there's, there are ways that you can overcome and, and you need to be comfortable with second and th- third tier lenders if you're going to build a larger portfolio in today's um, lending environment, particularly with, so that, those are the kind of questions you should be asking your broker before you even get, get, uh, get started on looking on realestate.com. So what is the fab? It is the fundamentals, analysis, and boots on the ground. Um, I don't really know what the slides are next, so I'm just going to kind of jump through to see if it's going to give me what I want. Oh, It'll give you what you want. Didn't give me what I wanted. I wanted, I wanted this one. I wanted oh, this one, man. Because these are the fundamentals. What are the fundamental drivers of that area? So tonight, Jeff and I are going to talk about two areas independently. I'm looking at a $600,000 area. He's looking at a four hundred to $450,000 area. Where the heck will we buy? So when you're doing, I'm thinking like, I've kind of framed my mind around, I have a client. Sorry, I have a person, investor. They're not, they're not a client of mine. They're doing their own thing. They want to go out there and spend their first property. What should the, be the basic things that I need to do to cover my ass a little bit as an investor? How do I do that? How do I make sure that when I go out there, I don't want to knock the lights out with a, you know, a 1% of the 1%er. Um, you know, that's that would be not, nice. But- that would be, that'd be very nice. You know, you do a lot more research, go a little bit deeper into it. But for their first property, they're thinking about, hey, how do I – um, make sure that I don't screw it up. A lot of people come to me and say, Hey, Joe, I just don't want to mess it up. And it's like, that's fair. That's fair enough. I've done. We, yeah. Anyway. So Wait, you and I both made mistakes here. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Um, so population, who are the people living there and how are they going to drive growth? Uh, uh, is it an aging population? Are people getting a lot older there? Are they starting to starting to, um, or is it, becoming younger are you getting more first families there is it going to shift a little bit more are there uh um more families getting made is there more yeah you you kind of it's kind of around families and age those type of things um employment is it a diverse workforce and what are the jobs and the types of property uh, kind of locations that bring money so think about it from like Wollongong for instance Wollongong is an area that has used to be heavy industry, right? There used to be a whole heap of heavy industry. Now they have the University of Wollongong. They've then changed a little bit. It's coastal. So when we start talking about desirability, do the people actually want to live there? And what is bringing home owner occupiers? Well, you've got a beautiful beach there. Um, But uh, going back to employment, we've got a great hospital. We've got a great university. And that's starting to bring smart people to spend smart money. They're getting smart money and they're spending a little bit more. As, as much as I love Wollongong, mate, um, I, the Wollongong Hospital is it's okay, but let's okay. let's um, let's yeah, let's call a spade a spade. It's 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 serviceable. We'll say that. I, I love I love anybody who works at Wollongong Hospital, and you've did a fantastic job. So, but compared to up, up in Sydney, mate, nothing beats the big smoke up in Sydney. But love okay. Wollongong, big fan, yeah. big supporter. But go on. Okay. You got so Terrible many drivers down here in Wollongong, Joe. If you want to talk about Wollongong, I should have done a session on that. But anyway, I know. 
I, sh- I shouldn't have spoken out of spoken out of school on the the Wollongong market. Um, so anyway, th- we're going back to the Fab Fundamentals Analysis Boots on the Ground. The projects, what are the big projects happening and what is driving the capital growth? If there is, and it's not necessarily per capita spend, sorry, it's not per dollar spent. So if there's a $2 billion project, like if you look on some of these infrastructure and project websites, you you, you can see there's $2 billion spent here, $8 billion spent here, proposed plans, proposed, proposed, proposed. That's the government proposing those things. There's probably a 40% chance of that thing actually happening. And do you think a wind farm, like a solar farm is going to bring like bring people? Yeah. When they're building it, it will. But what, what do you need to operate a, a solar farm? Not very much. You just need a couple of people, wipe the lens i I mean i have no idea about solar farms but i know that they don't drive um, a whole heap of value to the community so this is all just a little bit of an equation population plus projects plus employment plus desirability equal um your opportunity minus the supply of stock so the supply the is the sponge so we don't want a whole heap of stock coming on the market. So we've got this explore data tabs. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the group we talk about this, but you can work out what supply of stock is coming to an area. So is there a lot of infill developments coming on? Is there a lot of um, uh, a lot of greenfield locations happening? What is happening in the in the area? And you can you can see them all mapped out. And you look what is happening, what's coming up in the next twelve months, what's coming up in the next eighteen months, and uh, that's what's going to be there. So if you see a thousand houses coming to market in the suburb that you're buying, what are people going to be interested in your old house, or are they going to be interested in the newer houses? I don't know. Yeah, How's and I, I think it also comes comes down to um, if if you're if you're buying in that suburb, like how big is the block of land? Because can you is there some opportunity? Maybe not, but um, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Great point. But, Great point. Yeah, I, I still think you, you'd be, it's too much of a risk for me doing, doing that sort of, like you're speculating that a developer is going to pay you for that price of land when in reality that developer is, well, the, the, yeah, they're just essentially, they're doing a, 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 a sort of feasibility based on, so they need to buy your land for X amount of money. So they're not going to pay overs, they're not emotional. So yep. if they don't, if they can't afford to buy your block of land, they won't buy it for the price that you potentially want it for. But anyway. Analysis. Analysis is some of the hard data metrics that we're going to talk about soon. So that is supply and demand is one of them. Um, other things like days on market. We want to see days on market trending down. Um, listing prices. We want to see. Um, well, we want to see prices going up. To be fair, um, I yep. don't know why we've got a down arrow. Inventory levels it fixed going down. the vacancy down. rates, but yeah, yeah. listing Where's prices vac- now. Not quite vacancy 100%. rates going? Anyway, vacancy rates, yep, we want to see them sub 3%. Vendor discountings, we want to see the vendor limiting their discounts because it means that we're getting a hotter, hotter market. Um, But um, going back to this slide, I love this slide because what we're trying to work out here is, and it's pretty much the picture of a filter with 15,353 suburbs. That's how many suburbs there are in Australia. 3,800 have reliable data. And then you've got to overlay those 3,800 to your budget. So if your budget's 450 to 550,000, guess what? You've just cut 3,800 down to a lot less. While this is data-led and scientific, you do need to make sure that um, you get boots on the ground. You need to confirm what the data is telling you. I did uh, like a year and year and a half ago. I went to an area that specific. Actually, a su- actually, I did a, a couple of mu- a month and a half ago. I went to a suburb in WA um, where the data looks unreal, and there are people buying there right now in other in other groups um, saying oh, how amazing these places are, and it is an absolute dump. The problem is is the data and the SA3 for the area do not incorporate the vacant land. So from a data perspective, it looks really good. But over the other side, there's a whole heap of vacant land that isn't counting for the supply of this side. So it's not getting calculated into the supply of the property. But also this suburb and this suburb are the exact same thing. They're just on different sides of the street. My goal is not to knock the lights out with this location. 
Is this the absolute best location to be buying right now if you add $600,000? Um, depending on your brief, it might be perfect for you. This, this area is a perfect for you kind of set and forget location where long term, the fundamentals are there. The fundamentals are going to make sense and you're going to do all right because you've done the basic due diligence and identified the area yourself. And that area is... Where is it? How far away from Melbourne is it? Um, it is an hour and 15 minutes away from Melbourne. It is the city of Geelong. Um, Geelong is a very interesting market. Um, only an hour and 15 away. They are putting a lot of infrastructure, and I guess that's kind of what we'll, we'll talk to. So when we talk about things, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the population. We're going to talk about the projects, the employment, the desirability. Um, so let's start talking about those things um lifestyle um one of the drivers of of geelong is the lifestyle appeal um it has a lot of coastal living vibe um which is more and more increasingly adding to uh to bringing people to it so from a desirability standpoint it's very desirable but it's still very affordable as well um there is a bit of a diverse a diversification of housing stock as well um there are newer pockets um and there are the older the older points as well. Um, uh, they are trying to revitalize the areas a little bit more. So they're trying to spend money. Um, I'm trying to find, I had uh, some notes here about what they're spending in the area to bring it up. Um, I it just, it's not off the top of my head. Um, a Geelong city deal. That's what it is. Geelong city deal, $382 million, an agreement between Australian and Victorian governments for the city of Geelong to revitalize the city and stimulate economic growth. This deal includes the infrastructure, tourism, urban renewal projects. Some initiatives of the city deal include Geelong's convention and exhibition center and revitalizing city of Geelong. There is a Geelong fast rail that's getting in the pipelines. The spirit of Tasmania is now coming out of Geelong. So all of those people now need new jobs um, because there's all of these new people that need to get into the spirit of Tasmania. They need to do that thing. Um, so much infrastructure in Geelong City Council is going broke. Oh, dear. They need to manage their budgets a little bit better, but they're spending a lot right now. Um, so again, this is not a knock the lights out right now. What are the downsides of Geelong? One of them right now is the yield. The price has risen a lot. Um, it's it's hard to get that return um, for a yield perspective. Long-term capital growth, yes. I think if you buy in the right pockets, you're going to do really, really well. Uh, you're going to do well. You, really, really, really well. Uh, you know, you can do – there are better locations to be buying in um, right now. Um Again, they've got the city uh, – they've got the University of – um, what's it called? Deakin, Deakin University. That's bringing a lot more people. Let's talk. Let's talk, John. It's not. It's not all roses. Um, this is one thing to note as well. Um, uh, there's a high rate of low income households. So the Victorian average is eighteen point three percent for low incomes. In pockets of Geelong, in pockets of Norlane, um, that's 52%. So there is a much larger um, opportunity for housing stress. So yes, the houses are more affordable down there, but you do need to be very, very careful of the areas that you choose. Um, should you buy or should you bail? That was the question. Where did we get to? Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, out of all of the pockets, if I had $600,000 and I had to buy in an area that was, um, uh, yeah, I had 600, what was the, what was the brief? $600,000. And it was just a basic over the basic fundamentals of a, a long-term capital growth, um, buy and hold. Then I would be putting my money around that area, um, to keep, yeah, because it's valuable. Right? Had a great question. Love to see a comparison between Geelong, Wollongong and Newcastle. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. In fact, that is that is one of the things that I really like about Wollongong and Geelong. It's Geelong and Wollongong are exactly the same. Like they are literally they're the same place. They are both yeah. 85 kilometers away from the city. The weather's city. better down here, man. I, I don't know. I've been to Geelong, but oh, I imagine the weather is okay. rubbish down yeah. there. Yeah, that's very true. So Geelong is 75 kilometers southwest of Melbourne. Um, Wollongong is 85 kilometers from city. 
uh, from the city of Sydney. Um, they're both considered commuting distances. Um, mm -hmm. Population wise, Geelong has 275,000 people. Wollongong has 306,000 people. So both have steady population growth coming along. I think we've got a population growth chart somewhere. Um, I don't really want to make it too chart focused, but that's Geelong projects, massive projects coming in, project value, blah, blah, blah. Spirit of Tasmania population. So in 2021 to 2041, there's going to be a 33% increase in population, which is bloody massive, right? Mm. Um, both Geelong and Wollongong have a history of manufacturing heavy industry. Um, they are now uh, kind of transitioning to more knowledge intensive economies, right? So we're starting to see more healthcare, education, technology. Working from home has really helped Wollongong and Geelong. Um, they both have major universities. Geelong has the city of Geelong, uh, sorry, Deakin University in Geelong, and Wollongong has the University of Wollongong. Um, Newcastle both... has the Uni of Newcastle as well. Yeah, I didn't really throw Newcastle in that okay. mix. Um, both are lifestyle focused, lots of beaches, parks. Um, what I really like, why I like um, Wollongong, no, Geelong over Wollongong, is if, if, if Sydney's worth a million dollars, and I know it's not, Sydney's a million dollars, right? Um, July, uh, Sydney, Wollongong Melbourne. is is um, seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, so seventy to eighty percent the value of Sydney. Mm -hmm. In Geelong, let's say it's a million dollars in in um, in Geelong. Um, Geelong is worth uh, six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. Right. So there's a disparity, 60 to 70 percent rather than 70 to 80 percent of the value. So if you if you're pro Melbourne, you see there's a lot of growth coming to Melbourne. There is a differential between the two. The cities are very similar. They're very, very similar. But the disparity is is 10 percent of that. So you could say there's 10 percent value that can come up for the market. Now, they are not identical. They're not exactly the same thing. But I like to see that in the market.